One of the mistakes that I made and a great learning point for some other firemen, I think, is we're taught in the Mayday situation to, you know, say Mayday, 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 but, you know, remain calm. And for me, remaining calm was at the forefront of my mind. So I just keyed up my radio and I said, Captain 53 to command, I've got a Mayday, I'm disoriented in the building. And it sounded like just another transmission. Enchanted Sky Media. Media. From the Enchanted Sky Studios in Prescott, Arizona, this is Code 3, the Firefighters Podcast, hosted by award-winning journalist Scott Orr. Code 3 features interviews with leading members of the fire service, discussing firefighting strategies, tactics, and other topics you need to know more about. Now, here's Scott. That's right, and I will not let Parkinson stop me. Thank you for joining me again here on Code 3. This is the show for and about firefighters. We're informing and entertaining members of the fire service, just like you, from coast to coast. Have you ever become lost in a burning structure? It'll cause a pretty severe pucker factor, as my Air Force friends call it. And yes, becoming lost in a fire can easily be fatal. Today we've got a great interview We're going to hear from a captain in a volunteer fire department who found himself lost in a burning building. In January, Captain Alex Davis of the Lower Providence Fire Department responded to a working fire in his ski shop. The store, which is in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, is a 6,000 square foot structure built in 1950 with a second floor added in the 1970s. Alex was on the second arriving unit, a quint. He made entry with members of his crew who carried the hose line. In the confusion and darkness, he became separated from them. Alex called a mayday, but he did not panic, which probably saved his life. Thanks to good training, he was located and he got out. And Alex Davis joins me now. Welcome to Code 3. Thanks for having me. Well, that was quite an experience for you in that fire. Can you take me back to that day and tell me how it started? Certainly. The department was alerted for a commercial building fire for reports of smoke from the building. I was the apparatus officer for the first aerial, and our engine company was first in reporting what they believed to be a basement fire at the rear of the building. The building was approximately 150 feet by 40 feet wide, and had two levels. The upper level was a ski shop, and the lower level was a fireplace store. They arrived and stretched a hose line to the door on the upper level, which was on grade on the B side of the building, and I arrived and forced the door for them. Advanced in. They were unable to see anything due to to the smoke bank to the floor um, and the the known, you know, below-grade fire. So they backed out. I conferred with them about what was going on, and they said, they were going to have a hard time navigating in a, you know, a complex occupancy. They didn't know where they were going. We were looking for stairs to get to a lower level. We had seen some fire from uh, the lower level in the rear coming through the side of the building. So we conferred with who I believe to be a store employee who gave us the location of a stairwell. And my crew, which consisted of one other fireman, joined their crew, which consisted of three firemen. And together we took a line in searching for the stairs. So there were four firefighters on the hose line. Were you on the line also, or were you just with them? I was I was actually in front of them. So the primary concern was that uh, they weren't sure where they were going, and they were, of course, on the line, and we knew we would need significant manpower to get a hose line sneaked through a store full of shelves and racks and all that kind of stuff. So I decided to lead from in front of the line. I had a thermal imaging camera in a Halligan. I was checking the integrity of the floor because we knew the fire was underneath us and I basically went from the front. So you're out ahead, you can't see much, but you do have a thermal imaging camera. What happened when you got further into the structure? So as I'm feeling my way, we get to a corner in the building, which equates to the BC corner, where I believed the stairwell should be based on the information I had, and uh, there was no stairwell. So at that time, I instructed the crew that we needed to go back out, uh, and my foot became lodged in a, a rack or a shelf, and uh, I had to 
stopped for a second to make sure I didn't pull my foot out of my boot, and then I lost track of them. They, they were gone, and I was unable to reach them. Right, because they were able to double back on their hose line, but you were out ahead and didn't have that reference point. Correct. Once they were gone, my, my hose line or my lifeline to the outside was gone as well. So what was your first thought when you realized that? My first thought was, I can't believe these guys left me, right? And, and it was quickly, well... I'm going to just feel my way back along this wall and I'll run into them because I can move faster than they can because they have a hose line to back out and I don't. If you like Code 3, you'll love the Code 3 Bull Session. It's more discussion with our guests on any topic. Sometimes it's serious. Sometimes it's not so serious. But it's only available to patrons of Code 3. Find out what you've been missing. Go to Code3Podcast.com slash support. Pledge just $10 a month to support Code 3, and you'll get immediate access to all the bull sessions in our library and future interviews as we post them. Become a patron today, support the show, and get access to the Code 3 Bull Sessions. So you started feeling your way along the wall, but I gather that it was not helpful. Correct. It's hard to say with certainty, but based on speaking to people familiar with the building and crews that were on scene, I think I ended up on the opposite side of a long display case from them. You know, think of a, a, display, a glass display case or a wooden display case that would have skis and things like that in it. And I mistook that to be the wall. And so I followed that thinking it was the wall, and it kind of led me out into the middle of the floor plan. Uh, well, they were able to actually use the B-side wall to make it back to the door. So now you're all alone in there, and you have no idea how to get out. What did the guys on the line do when they got out the door? Did they suddenly realize that you weren't with them? Yeah, that's correct. So the engine officer is a a veteran firefighter, uh, and he did a head count when we came out and realized I was missing. So I had actually declared a mayday. And he didn't hear it, and about 30 seconds later, he, rep- he called in a mayday for a missing firefighter. Now, was your radio now working, or did others hear your mayday? The radio was working, and my mayday went out. One of the mistakes that I made, and a great learning point for some other firemen, I think, is we're taught in the mayday situation to, you know, say, mayday, 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 but, you know, remain calm. And for me, remaining calm was at the forefront of my mind. So I just keyed up my radio and I said, Captain 53 to command, I've got a mayday, I'm disoriented in the building. And it sounded like just another transmission. And a lot of firefighters on the fire ground later said that just the fact that I said, the way I said it didn't really call their attention that this was a mayday. That's interesting. So you're saying that people can become so complacent about hearing chatter on the radio that sometimes they don't even hear some of it? Yeah, I think absolutely. You know, I think back to fires I go to. Sometimes there's a lot of radio chatter, and I'm keeping my ear ear out for certain things, right? People calling me, uh, people providing information that's going to matter to me and what I'm doing. But if there's some folks two floors away talking about nonsense, I'm not really uh, not really keyed into that. I'm not saying that's right or that's wrong, but that's how I am, and I, I think that there's others that are like that as well. Are you at this point worried that you're going to run out of air and be trapped in there? No, I, not at that point. And, you know, at this point, the radios lighten up. It was acknowledged relatively quickly. I think I, I could tell by radio chatter that people knew what was going on. It took the command officer a little bit of time to get back to me, but that's because he had switched channels to a clear channel to contact our county dispatch office and let them know that we had a mayday situation. But, no, at that point, my air was fine. A lot of the guys I was in there with had been in twice, right? They went in, they backed out. And they went back in with me, and my air was fine. And at that point, I'm still thinking, I'm going to find my way out of here. Right, you know, right when I called the mayday. I called it because I knew it was the right thing to do. My training told me not to mess around and, and call it. But I was still pretty convinced at that point that I was going to find my own way out. We don't often get to hear what goes through the mind of someone who's trapped in a building that they can't find their way out of. It sounds like in your case, you just relied on your training and said, I've got to find my way out. If they find me, that's fine, but I'm getting myself out of here. That's absolutely what I did. How did it work out? Did you find your way most of the way out, or did they find their way most of the way in? The entire incident from the time I got separated from them to the time I was able to exit the building was about seven minutes. And after I called the mayday, I figured I'm my best option here. I'm I'm a doer. I'm not going to hope somebody come finds me. I'm going to make sure I can find my way out. 
And shortly after, when I was crawling through clothing racks and all kinds of obstacles, the dense smoke made hearing very difficult. I started to think that the best way to get out would be to ask them to, uh, for noise to orient, right? I wasn't injured. I didn't have an air emergency. It was too warm for comfort without a hose line or a way out, but it wasn't searing hot. And I thought, all I need is for someone to point out where this door is. So I asked for them to bang with sledgehammers, and I asked for them to, you know, with whatever they had. And it, after a while, it became evident that they were doing that, and I was unable to hear anything. And then I really started to fear that someone was going to have to come get me and that I was going to be unable to find my own way out. It sounds as though they did finally find you. Is that right? That is correct. I, all along, I kept moving the direction I thought I needed to move, and I was trying to gain a bearing of my surroundings, which, of course, in, in no visibility smoke and, and a lot of clutter in a retail occupancy was very difficult. But a fireman, a lieutenant, actually, of our department came into the building, um, and he had made an assumption that he didn't know where I was, uh, but that straight in the door, there wouldn't be a lot of clutter. So he came straight in about 10 feet and had either a hook or a halligan and started banging on the floor. And that did catch my attention. And then I was able to make my way over to him, and he led me the rest of the way out. And you suffered no significant injuries from this whole incident. That is correct. How long have you been a firefighter? About 15 years. Have you experienced anything similar to this previously? No. Uh, I, I've been locally uh, going to various departments and speaking about this. And, uh, you know, firefighters, we, we go to fire sometimes. Sometimes they're good. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're no fun. You know, when you're burning down a warehouse and you're in 10-degree cold for eight hours, it's not fun. And what I tell people is uh, this is the first not fun fire I've been to in my career. This is a whole nother level. Did it give you any pause to reconsider your volunteer work? No, you know what? It did not. I knew right away that it's not something I wanted to give up. I do have a family. I have a wife and a daughter and another child on the way. So I, I thought about that and, and what that meant. But, uh, you know, I determined this is something I want to do. I, I think the way that I sleep at night knowing that is I made some mistakes at this fire. And it was certainly some mistakes that I won't make again. Not to say that can remove enough or even all the risk, but I, I feel comfortable that I won't make these mistakes again. And I'm willing to continue to do what I do because I love it. Now, you work in finance for your day job, is that right? That's correct. You got to tell me, was there a moment where you stood there in this building totally lost and said to yourself, what the hell am I doing in here? Yeah, uh, as, it would, as it would turn out, and this call came in about 10 of 9 a.m. in our local time, and I was supposed to go to breakfast with my wife and daughter at 9, and when it came in, I said, got to go. And there was a time I was crawling around in that building, and I thought to myself, Damn, I should have just gone to breakfast today. I'm glad to hear that it didn't convince you to stop volunteering because obviously volunteer fire departments need people with your level of experience who can convey these stories so that they don't happen to anyone else. Yeah, and, and I really appreciate getting to speak to you and for whatever you know, you're able to share with others that it may help them. It makes it all worth it. So what is the one lesson that you'd say is the major thing you take from having had this happen? One lesson, that's tough. I'll go very, very specific. In my situation, I needed noise to orient myself, right? So when we talk about rescuing firefighters in a rapid intervention type of scenario, we need to understand what the real problem is. Are they trapped? Are they hurt? Are they just lost? Do they have an air emergency, right? And our rescue plan calls for us to act accordingly. And I think in this case, the issues that I was having was that, one, I couldn't find my way out, and two, it was getting too warm for comfort. And what would have helped me a lot was if someone had taken a two-and-a-half or other larger diameter hose line and placed it in service right in the compartment I was in. Probably would have heard it because it would have been very loud, obviously. Water is typically loud and readily available at water scenes, or I'm sorry, fire scenes. And water also would have provided some much-needed cooling in the compartment I was in. It would have lessened the effects of the heat I was feeling. So I would, I would say my number one lesson learned is if I ever am on the rescuing side of a simply lost firefighter in a large compartment, I'd put a big hose line in service. And that's about the best we can ask for a bad situation is to come up with a real-world solution. Alex Davis, thanks for joining me on Code 3. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And we put some more information on the situation leading to Alex's May Day on our website at code3podcast.com slash lost. Check it out. 
All right, that is it. That is all for this edition of Code 3. What did you think of today's show? I'd love to hear about it. Just email me, scott at code3podcast.com. Thank you for listening. I'll be back next time with more, and I hope you will too. I'm Scott Orr, and until then, stay safe. Code 3 is a production of Enchanted Sky Media. To contact us, get more information on today's topic, or subscribe to the podcast, go to Code3Podcast.com.